Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. There it is. Fantastic. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here in Kuwait. Thank you very much for the invitation. And how about another round of applause for Kayaks, Equate, and KNPC? What a fantastic conference this has been for the past couple of days. My name is Jay Abdallah, and I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Services for Schneider Electric. I'm responsible for the EMEA and Asia Pacific region. One of the things that's challenging about being the absolute last presenter of the conference is the subject matter. I can't even stand up here in front of you today and say there's not much left to say because Hassan already said that too. So I'm going to do my best to try and give you folks some examples of what has already been discussed, some proof, so to speak. We say in the United States, innocent until proven guilty. Well, hopefully my presentation will give you a little bit of background upon that. My colleagues from Honeywell and Siemens and Dr. Reem, everybody else that has spoken today has so eloquently discussed the fact that we have plenty of different threat vectors. My particular focus today is going to be on the human element. So we're going to talk about that human vulnerability, that human weakness, but I'm not going to go into the details that you've already seen. That being said, we'll jump right into the agenda. We're going to talk about the current threat landscape. I'll just give you a brief snapshot of what it looks like today. Then we'll talk about that threat vector that everybody's so familiar with. We'll talk about some very minimal mitigation strategies and then I'll ask some questions and, of course, provide the answers. We give these presentations generally throughout the entire world, and these are some of the hottest questions that are being asked of us as ICS vendors. So we'll start right away with the current threat landscape. What you're seeing on screen now is from Norse. This is a one-minute screen grab of some live attacks that are happening. Whoa. As you can see, somebody's not very happy with our election results in November. We'll let that pass. So as you can see, there are constantly attacks happening every minute of every day. These don't stop for Ramadan or for Eid or for Christmas. These are consistently happening throughout the course of every minute of every day. So it's our responsibility as vendors of industrial control systems and automation systems to provide the highest level of security from level one all the way up to and including level four. That's from a technological aspect. But I feel like we're missing a big piece of the puzzle here. And this is the human aspect. So when we start talking about that human aspect, we have to understand what we're up against. Now, the statistics that you're seeing on screen now is from the United States Department of Homeland Security. Every year, they publish a report called the ICS CERT report. Now, unfortunately, they have not yet published the annual report for 2016, but some of these numbers, as the next slide you'll see, they are actually fairly relevant for 2015 as well. We can see over 500,000 new malware events being created every day. So it's certainly a subject that needs our precise involvement and obviously our precise awareness as well. We can see that in 2017 is actually climbing to look a little bit higher than those results in 2016 as well. Now, these are statistics that you've already seen, so I'm not going to beat them to death. Again, these are from 2015. The most important in my particular perspective is the last one. We can see, oops, go back one more, please. We can see actually that the, the, the fact that they have increased by 20%, one more, please. We can see that since they've increased by 20%, the problem's not going away. So the question that I always ask myself is, where did this begin? Now, I think you're all very familiar with these ICS attacks, and of course, since we've now seen them in the news and in major publications over the past several years, I always like to ask myself, where did it get the biggest attention? Where did it start? And where did that attention vector turn into mainstream media coverage? Now, there's a movie out there, and as a matter of fact, this is the trailer that you're about to see in just a moment. I highly encourage you all to take a look at this movie. It's called Zero Day. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't just focus on one particular event. It talks about industrial control systems in general. And you'll get a really nice understanding of what the threat vectors look like today. Why can't we talk more openly and publicly about stuff? Two answers before you even get started. I don't know, and if I did, we wouldn't talk about it anyway. Something as simple and innocuous as this becomes a challenge for all of us to maintain accountability and control of our critical infrastructure systems. This actually contains the Stuxnet virus. It's impacting industrial control. Is this something that's coming after the homeland? If you get up in the morning and turn off your alarm and make coffee. Power plants, power grids. And pump gas. Transportation, telecommunication. And use the ATM. 
You've touched industrial control systems. It's what powers our lives. Most of these systems are relatively easy for a sophisticated hacker to get into. The security experts who are studying Stuxnet really think it required the resources of a nation state. It spread to any Windows machine in the entire world. We didn't know if it was set to turn off all electricity plants around the world or it would start shutting things down or launching some attack. It was blowing up centrifuges and it was leaving no trace. There have been assassinations of nuclear scientists. Some human assets had to be involved. Spies. It went beyond our worst fears, our worst nightmares. This is not your ordinary criminal doing this. This is someone bigger. The monster turned against its creator. And now everyone is in this game. This has the whiff of August 1945. Somebody just used a new weapon. And this weapon will not be put back into the box. You've been focusing on Stuxnet, but that was just a small part of a much larger mission. So like I said, it's, it's a great idea to take a look at that movie. It'll certainly give you a little bit of perspective. And what I like to look at is the fact that, you know, not only are we talking about a significant advancement when it comes to these types of threat vectors, but it actually puts up a huge wall, right, in terms of the learning curve. Do we really have to understand the specific technologies behind these types of attacks? And the answer, of course, is no. As a matter of fact, the creators of that particular malware infestation itself were infected by their own code. I actually had a snapshot, and you can do a Google search, although I do not recommend it. You can actually see snippets of the code itself. It looks like gibberish. It doesn't even actually look like machine language. It's very, very sophisticated. So sophisticated, by the way, that it's still prevalent in the marketplace today. Different variants of that particular infestation are actually available today. So let's take a look at the biggest threat vectors. Now again, we've already talked about these three examples. So I'm not going to go into detail about them. As you can see, since these have each been discussed, what I'd like to focus on is where is the common denominator? Each one of these has the number two behind it, right? We talked about Shamoon, and we talked about the fact that in August of 2012, it was the first time we saw it, and again, we just saw it at late last year. That's twice. We said the Ukrainian power grid situation, it happened at the end of 2015, and again, we just saw it resurface itself a couple of months ago. Then we talked about the German steel mill, and the German steel mill was very unique because it was only the second time in recorded history that we saw physical damage being done inside of a plant. And yet again, we were hit by it within one year. So the question that I have is, where is the common denominator? And the common denominator in this case is always the human element. It's the human element because apparently we haven't learned. We haven't taken it to that next step in an effort to protect ourselves. So let's take, for example, the situation in the Ukraine. It was mentioned on day one that uh, 200 kilowatts of power, I believe, were unavailable to the city. That's absolutely correct. It's actually 20%. One-fifth of the entire grid in northern Kiev was wiped out. So when we take a look at those statistics, and then we realize that this came in through an infectious malware email that was then proliferated throughout the network infrastructure, and then one year later, it happened again. Well, how does that happen? Does that mean we really haven't learned anything over the course of that one year? We also said this was a very powerful attack that must have been sponsored by a nation state. Now, I'll tell you this. I was in Russia last week, and I give these presentations all over the world, and in this particular case, I forgot to remove that small snippet. So you can imagine how awkward it was for me to be standing in front of a bunch of Russian nuclear scientists at the International Business Congress saying, yeah, this required the nation state. And then I remembered where I was, and it was definitely a bit awkward. But in either case, I want to show you the first bit of proof that humans in general are naturally trusting and naturally trustworthy beings. So let's proceed on with the second piece of evidence. The most popular password in the United States is password123. And as long as, we're, as long as that's the case, we're vulnerable. So today we sent a camera out on the Hollywood Boulevard to help people by asking them to tell us their password. And <laughs> this is how that went. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? 
It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. But, Has yeah. you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm-hmm. So, like, a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like, number one? Uh, like, my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So, Jolie, 6, 12, 95. Yes. Got it. Got it. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So, like... Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's Uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh, yeah. Now you know my password. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's really that simple, folks. My friend Jimmy Kimmel showing us specifically how easy it is to really infiltrate those systems. Some of my colleagues were talking a little bit earlier about where is the first place that we go when we do a penetration test? Some folks said we go right towards the intrusion prevention systems, we go towards the firewalls, we look at the perimeter, we look at the servers themselves. None of our teammates go directly to the technology. The first thing we do is talk about people. We walk around, we have a fake badge, we ask questions, we have a clipboard in our hands, and you'd be surprised how many times people are more than happy to give up that information. It's not because they're ignorant to the fact that these are security threats. It's because either they're forgetful or they simply don't know any better. Now, some of you are looking at the screen behind me saying, why is my name on the screen? And by the way, if your name is on the screen, I suggest you uh, take a look at your mobile phone. Because everybody's name who's on the screen right now is transmitting a Wi-Fi signal. Close the doors, please. Let's make sure nobody leaves. Mind you, the screenshot that you're actually seeing are the 20 or 25 Wi-Fi distribution signals. So these are the people that are currently providing Wi-Fi, but these are actually protected. There was a page that, of course, I did not show of six additional phones in this room that have completely open Wi-Fi access. Completely open. So if we were to add just some penetration testing, a little bit more, maybe uh, some some intrusion type hacking, anything we learn in the CEH committees, we could probably make our way into these mobile devices fairly quickly. Now, speaking of iPhones, how many of my fellow colleagues here have the new iPhone 7? Now, of course, nobody wants to raise their hand, right? Okay, great. iPhone 7. Now, back in September, I believe, they released it. And, of course, everybody goes crazy for the new Apple hype. My wife was one of them. I need to get the new iPhone 7. I said, hon, I swear to you, there's really no difference. It's got a physical button or it's got a, a, a pneumatic button instead of a physical button, whatever they want to call it, haptic feedback. Other than that, it's pretty much the same device, but for the most part, people want the latest technologies. So I'm going to show you a little bit of proof. When they go stir-crazy about these Apple announcements, what can actually happen? We went out on the street, we asked iPhone users if they wanted to try the new iPhone, the iPhone 7. And when we took their current phone, we cleaned it, we put it in a different case, and we handed the phone right back to them. Told them it was the new one. Do you think we found anyone who believed that? Well, let's find out with this first look at the iPhone 7. We've gotten some prototypes of the 7, and what the great thing about the 7 is it's an instant data transfer. So you could transfer a lot of your settings from your current phone to the 7 and try it out instantly as if it was your own phone. Oh, cool. Do you want to take a spin? Absolutely. Okay, great. Would you mind giving Patrick your old phone? Do you need my passcode? Okay. It will automatically do it. (laughs) And you said you've had one since the 3? Oh, yeah. Probably since, I'd say, 2011 or 2010, whenever that one came out. Now, this new one is water resistant, right? Yes. Now, have you ever had uh, anything where you've gotten water on any of your iPhones? Yes. I, uh, what, what happened? Dropped it in the toilet. Dropped it in the toilet? <laughs> yeah. And did you do the rice thing? Yes, I did. did and it, it work? didn't work, no. Okay. Oh, no. and we have, we have the new iPhone with wow. all the settings. Okay. In it. Wait, so this is like all my stuff on it? This is all your stuff on the new one. Cool. That's and what, great. How does it feel? Thinner. Thinner? <laughs> a little bit. Does it feel uh, lighter as well? 
Yeah, actually, then then my six plus, yes. And uh, you could test to see if all your info has transferred. Has it transferred? Yeah, I already got a text message from a friend of mine, so yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> um, let's see. So can you just sort of talk to us about the features of the phone? How does it feel? How does it look? It's a lot smoother. I like it. It feels lighter, feels lighter. than the other one. It definitely looks a lot more crisp. Yeah, a lot more clear. Um, even the the, um, the screen itself, like there's, I don't know, it looks more um, smooth and glossy, I guess, right, shall we yeah. say? Like, it's much clearer. It's much clearer than the yes. old phone? And in terms, of, in terms of speed, what would you say? Is it faster? Uh, much faster. Well, the new <laughs> phone will be about $600, yeah. but today, if you give us like a 50, we will just let you walk away with that phone. You're joking. No, nope. I swear to God, for 50 bucks. That's like a new Apple thing. Okay. You ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll do it. I don't have a fifty dollar bill, but I can get one. <laughs> do you want to go to a cash machine and sure. come right back? Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. She had it already. So. She had it already. There you go. Okay, great. And here's Sweet. your brand new iPhone Seven. <laughs> Yay! Okay. That is great. And now oh. everything is going to be transferred over, and everything. Everything is. You can even check it out. It's exactly the same. Brand new phone in your old case. Okay. For fifty bucks. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Because that's your old phone. Yeah. yeah. Huh? There we go. It's inherently trustworthy. So you want to spend the money and spend the time and go try and hack those systems that in some cases have inherent security. In my perspective, go hack that weak link because it's your first way into the system. So... Let's talk about that human vulnerability really quick. First of all, we talked about the fact that we are inherently trustworthy beings, right? We're, we're trusting beings. That's absolutely correct. What about the fact that the natural human response, now I want to think about this from all of our perspectives, the natural human response is to project blame. Now that might be a hard pill to swallow, but think about that. As a matter of fact, I actually had experience just right before I left. I was in the kitchen. I grabbed an egg, and I dropped it. And the first thing that came to my mind, I looked down, and I said, who put that tile there? But the reality is, we normally want to blame somebody else. I'm not even kidding. Three days before I came here today, my friends at the Dubai police, they're not my friends, they sent me five text messages. Each one was a traffic violation. One for speed, two for parking, one for red light, and one for mobile phones, and it was all for my wife's car. So I was hot and heavy. I was ready to call her and ready to say, look what you just did. This is so expensive, et cetera, et cetera. And then I realized that four of those were me. It's natural. That's what we do. We want to project blame. So in terms of our responsibilities from a corporate perspective to protect our plant assets, we want to look at the inherent technologies, and we want to say, this is where the problem is. We don't necessarily want to think of the fact that we really need to look at ourselves first. And we really need to educate ourselves before we take that next step. Complacency. Oops, let's go one more back. Sorry. By the way, I'm running this on my Mac, so every time I go like this, they click on the button. Sorry, go one back, please. So, when we talk about complacency and we talk about obscurity and ignorance and, of course, luck, these are not forms of, by any stretch of the imagination of cyber resilience. We actually need a proper program in place. We need actionable response not only from the end users but from the vendors themselves. So that includes vendors, for example, in my case, Schneider Electric has invested millions into ensuring that every single layer of that plant information system is secured, down from the PLC all the way up to and including layer four. And of course, we created a training division specifically to focus on that human vulnerability. Knowledge, without a doubt, is power. And knowledge and education are, without a doubt, the best forms of protection. So let's talk really quickly about some mitigation strategies. We talk about defense in depth. You've heard this a million times, so I'm not going to beat it to death again. But what you'll see being painted on the screen is not only the fact that we have to focus on the data, but that also the very first line of perimeter is policies, procedures, and awareness. Awareness being the program itself, the training program. It's absolutely necessary to have a training program that is not only supported by your executive team, but is also filtered down through HR into the individual levels with a specific responsibility for annual maintenance of that training program. 
At Schneider Electric, for example, they make us take cybersecurity courses every year. It's a one-hour online training course just to give general awareness. We want to ensure that we're looking into that. You've all seen this picture today in several cases. You've seen multiple layers of security when it comes to protecting an ICS. You've got that layer four. You've got a DMZ aspect with a sandwich of north and south firewalls. We've got a virtualization system. We've got an endpoint protection system with multiple layers of security. But the reality is there is an inherent vulnerability at every single one of these levels, and that's the operator. And that's the individual users. That's each and every one of us collectively that has the access to these systems that can allow any types of penetration to actually come in. So another suggested mitigation strategy is adopting a standard. Now, my friends from ISA are here. We talked about patch management a few minutes ago. ISA 99, IEC 62443 are fantastic standards. And what you'll see, the last two actually, are a new breed of standards. QCERT was developed in Qatar, and the, uh, the uh, NESA, NISA, was developed by the United Arab Emirates. We've actually seen this same type happen in Saudi Arabia as well, where they've actually designed specific standards within their own countries to ensure that these industrial control systems are protected. Let's talk very quickly about frequently asked questions. The first question that we ask, what is the first line of defense when it comes to protection? I think everybody here, based on the fact that this is a human vulnerability presentation, we understand that the human vulnerability is without a doubt the first place of defense where we should be focusing our efforts. The second question is, how do I start the training program? I briefed upon this a couple of minutes ago. We talked about the fact that executive support is absolutely necessary in order to establish and maintain a cybersecurity posture maintenance program. It's absolutely necessary. From there, it gets filtered into human resources, and that becomes part of your standard training for every single employee on an annual basis. The next question is, I'm quite familiar with security, but how do I make sure that my company is? A lot of folks here have talked about the fantastic services that they provide, not only just offline penetration testing, but vulnerability analysis, risk analysis, risk assessments. Those are obviously going to give you a picture overall what does your posture look like? So the final question is, is there a single perfect solution? Now here's one of the other advantages of being the last presenter. Everybody before me has said no, there is no single perfect solution, there is no silver bullet, it's not a magical pill that you can take and automatically everything gets fixed. But since I'm the last presenter, I have the final word and I can say that I finally found one. I've been searching the internet, I've been doing my research and over the past several years, I've looked in deepest, darkest places of the earth, and I finally found what I believe is the solution to all of our cybersecurity problems. And here it is. Online passwords. There's just too many. And who can remember all those tricky combinations? So you stick them on your monitor, or you hide them in a drawer. But not anymore. Introducing Password Minder, the personal logbook that takes the hassle out of passwords. Forget about sticky notes or scraps of paper, because Password Minder has been specifically designed to organize and safely store passwords. You'll find them in an instant and never lose a password again, guaranteed. Need to make a password? Just add it to your Password Minder. The alphabetical listing organizes all your usernames and passwords for instant recall and easy reference. Now that I have Password Minder, I haven't lost a single password. It's so convenient. Plus, the Password Minder features a discreet leatherette-bound cover to ensure your passwords stay a secret. And there's plenty of room, enough for hundreds of passwords. And it's not just for passwords, it also stores your software licenses, network settings, and tricky email configurations permanently. You'll never lose important settings again, even if your computer crashes, because you're back up and running in seconds with all your vital information right at your fingertips. In fact, with Password Minder, you'll never lose critical computer settings again. I don't have to worry anymore about security or identity theft. I now have all my passwords in one place. It's great. If you have passwords, you need Password Minder. So call now and get your very own Password Minder book for just 10 So as you can see, folks, as long as there's people out there that can honestly go out there and buy a book, a notepad, for $10 and think that their magical problems have just disappeared, every one of you is going to have a job for several more years to come. My name is Jay Abdallah, and I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity. I think I have one minute left for questions. Thank you.